last week we looked at spiritual conflict happening in our lives, but from the ground level perspective. And today uh, we're going to literally take it up a notch by looking at it from a cosmic level. But I want to just walk back here because this is what you've been looking at. If you've been at Life Center for any degree of time for the entirety of the summer, that here we really can see that it is the word of God and the word of God became flesh. And the word of God became flesh and died a death that we deserve to give us a life that only we could live. This is the gift of Christ, the work of Christ. As, as Jay just shared a moment ago, he was hosting, it is the finished, complete work of Jesus. How many of you know the work of Jesus is finished and complete? But the work in us is unfinished. Okay, so this is the cross. The scripture says that Jesus is now forever making intercession for us. Intercession in terms of what? It is against the works and the tactics and the plans the enemy would have for our individual lives, for our relationships, for our families, for our cities, for our nation, and for our world. And so this is this beautiful picture that I'll refer to a couple of times as we go through it today regarding spiritual conflict. The truth is this. The enemy has a personal plan for your life. He then he stretches it out. He has a plan for your relationships. He has a plan for your family. He has a plan for your neighborhood. He has a plan for every church. He has a plan for every city. He has a plan for every nation. And he has a plan ultimately for the, the whole world. And the truth of it is this. That oftentimes and at times, you and I, though we are following Jesus, can unwittingly advance his plans if we're not being submitted and careful and aware of the schemes of the enemy. And so what we want to talk about today is not just ground level warfare. We want to talk about a little bit higher, a more of a cosmic level, which I know can get really weird really quick, but I pray we just get a glimpse into it. Really what we're saying, which you're going to hear me mention of again and again, is that there is some form of conflict that happens up there that can affect our lives down here. There's a reality of the spiritual realities of what happens, not just in our hearts and life, not just like, for example, when we hold unforgiveness and that gives access to the enemy in that one area of our life. That can become an internal stronghold that affects a relationship. But then there can be things up here, not just in here, up here that hinder and affect, and affect on a different scale. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 2 in the NIV says, you're not going to go, it's not going to come on the screen because I just added it. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 2 says, you used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. Other translations say that the enemy is the prince of the power of the air. So it's up here, not just in here. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. You and I, to calm our hearts, love to think about the world in three ways. We love to think that there is the power of God, there is the power of darkness, and then there's just neutrality. We like to think about there are people who belong to Jesus, and then there are those like Satanists, like they, they, maybe they belong to the enemy, and the, everyone else is just kind of in this neutral space. I'm sorry, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that you and I either, are either sons of obedience or we are sons of disobedience. Now, sons is not a, a gendered term, meaning just males. It's an inheritance term in Scripture, referring to males and females, that you and I are either sons of obedience to Christ or we are sons of disobedience too. That there are two realities, not separate, not three, not four. There are two realities. And so there are three biblical definitions that you need to understand that are at work in the world today, up here and impacting our lives. These are often known as the unholy trinity. So we know the holy trinity, God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit working together. One God, three persons, the holy trinity. We know that, hopefully. But there's this unholy trinity also at work in the life in the world today. It starts, of course, with the devil, who is the chief fallen angel. He is the prince of the power of the air. The devil is not omnowing. He is not omniscient. He is not everywhere at all times. So when you hear Christians say, man, the devil's really attacking me, probably not the devil himself, okay? Probably not, because he can be one place at one time. He's the prince of the power of the air, but it could be a demonic force. It could be something oppressive or in, engaged in that space. So the devil is the chief fallen angel. He is a created being. Do not ever think about there is God and then there is Satan. Don't think of it that way. There is God and then there is everything else created, including Satan, this way. He's a, it's a chief fallen angel leading active, ongoing rebellion against God. Again, Ephesians 2.2, 2, we just read. He's the prince of the power of the air. And then there's our flesh, which is not just talking about our physical bodies, though it can encompass that. 
Our flesh, though, is more talking about our sin-infected human nature. Because, by the way, the story that I pointed out here, the original story of God is that you and I would live in a garden, nothing separating God's presence, that we'd be, have full access to everything that he created that he called good in the garden. There was this beautiful tree called life, but he gave us this idea, humanity, one thing. There's this other one over here, the weight of good and evil, the weight on your shoulders. Leave that on my shoulders. Leave the weight of good and evil on my shoulders. Don't touch that tree. And then the enemy came in the form of a serpent, deceived us. And so now we have a different plan, not knowing the weight of good and evil. We took that on ourselves and away it went. I'll make reference to that again. So our flesh, everybody born after that moment, is born into a sin-infected human nature, which means that we are sons of disobedience that need to become sons of obedience. There's only a single cure. There's only one cure to a sin-infected human nature, which is the redeeming work of Christ. There's no other way. I am the way, Jesus said, the truth and the law life, that nobody comes to the Father except through we and through me. Now, there are many paths to Jesus, but there is only a single path to the Father, and that is through Christ. Some people come to Jesus in a moment of revelation. Some people come to Jesus when their life bottoms out. Some come to Jesus listening to a testimony. It is all the work of the Spirit happening in people's hearts and lives. So there's many different ways that God touches people's hearts, but there's only one way to the Father. There's only one way to be reconciled, and that is through the work of the Son. And then the last thing is, so there's the devil, there's our flesh, and then there's the world. The world is the systems that we create. And we as a culture have been talking about systems for probably for a couple of years now, and really we've been talking about a lot longer than that, but the systems that we create that can be unjust, they can be unjust towards demographics and people groups. There are systems of the world that we create that can have disproportionate effects on other people. So what we're really saying is the world is really the systems that we create, which the demonic uses to hinder us seeing on earth as it can be in heaven. And so some people experience heaven on earth and other people people because of the worldly systems that they live under experience hell on earth. And these are things that the demonic uses in our lives. This is why the word says that you and I are to be separate, called out from the world. We're to be in it, but not of it. We are not to contribute to the work of darkness. We are to contribute to God using our lives to make a Jesus-sized difference in the world in which we live. Are you with me? We're going quick this morning, a bit like a fire hose, so buckle up. Daniel chapter 10, Daniel chapter 10, you can turn or tap there. It's our first story in the Old Testament. It gives us our first glimpse into this spiritual world that we want to use today. Daniel is fasting and praying for three weeks, okay? He is praying and he is fasting for three weeks without answer. Uh, if I was, you know, if you're allowed to turn to the person beside you, I would have you turn to the person beside you. Since you're not, you can do it metaphorically. Turn to the person beside you, but don't actually do it and say to them, three weeks, he's praying for three weeks without an answered prayer. I've been waiting for 30 years for an answered prayer. Three weeks, oh, woo, woo, woo. We love to compare. Daniel's been praying, though, for fasting and praying for three weeks without answer. And then through this vision, here's what we see. It says, then he said to me, fear not, Daniel, for from the first day. This is what this angel says to Daniel. Fear not, Daniel, from the first day. Now, he's been praying for 21 days, has no idea. Then we see this. From the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard. Daniel, it isn't that God didn't hear your prayer. There was conflict to get the answer to you. And I have come because of your words. The prince of the kingdom of Persia. Now here, he's not referencing a prince over Persia that is a person. He's talking about a spirit, a power, a principality. In the Old Testament, they were called gods. Small g, but gods, okay? That had power and authority over a region. That there was something between Daniel praying on earth, praying. Heaven was hearing. God hears prayer. But somewhere between Daniel praying, heaven hearing, there was conflict in order to get the answer through. But Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help, for I was there with the king of Persia. So again, the prince of the kingdom of Persia had an assignment over the Persian empire. Conversely, Michael, an archangel, had a special assignment to care for the nation of Israel. And Daniel is there on earth fasting and praying. Remember, he's doing something down here that is affecting something up there. He's fasting and praying on earth, but there's this conflict in this unseen but very real realm. John Mark Comer, who I'm going to quote twice today, says this. All I am saying is that there seems to be spiritual beings with a measure of power and authority over geographic areas and people groups. That's all I'm saying. Is there seems to be a measure of power and authority over geographic areas and people, group, people groups. Stories like this give us a glimpse into the realm of the spirit once again. 
the conflict taking place up there somehow affects a portion of our lives down here. Now, remember what I shared a few weeks ago. If you're going to complete a puzzle and there's 300 pieces to the puzzle, then you need all 300 pieces. So today, I'm not saying this is every single piece. No, there's lots of different reasons why there can be unanswered prayer from the sovereignty of God that we're not praying God's will. Okay, there's lots of different reasons. I'm not saying this is every piece in the puzzle, but what I am saying is simultaneously, just as you can't finish the puzzle without having all the pieces, you can't also solve it just using the same 50 pieces. And there are some of you who are doing all the work in the area of your heart. You, you, your heart is clean before the Lord. You're engaging spiritual disciplines with your whole heart. You're surrendered and submitted to him. But there may be a spiritual reality that needs to be taken authority over that somewhere in your family line, there could have been allegiance to something that has access that needs to be closed up. That there's a spiritual reality. I'm not saying it's the reason for everything. I'm saying it's a part. It's a puzzle piece. And this is what we can see in the scripture. Did you know that, here's a good example, in the city of Ottawa that we live in, how many of that Ottawa is very different than Montreal? Ottawa is very, very different than Vancouver. Ottawa is very different than Toronto. Ottawa is incredibly different than if you go out east. And there's culture, and there's people, and there's all different things that we can look at. But here's also what we know. Is sometimes people with spiritual gift of discernment can walk into a city and go, ooh, there's something different in this city than where I come from. Capital cities have different powers and principalities because what happens here affects nation. And it's different. And it's different. Let me give you an example, just a regional example. Did you know that if you look at the city of Ottawa, that in the last 15 years, 20 years, did you know that churches planted in the south end of the city have a 10 times higher failure rate than anywhere else in the city? Did you know that? Did you know that, though, that is not true of any other religion except Christianity? Interesting. What is that? Why is that? Study the building of our city and you'll begin to tap into Freemasonry in different areas of our city, like the South. That sometimes there can be things in an area, in a geographic region. I'm not saying it's all of your thing. I'm just saying it's part of the pit puzzle that we have to look at. All right. A second example you may be familiar with is, how many of you have ever heard the name Moses? Can I see your hands, please? You ever heard the name Moses? From the Bible, I mean, not just like your buddy Moses who you go to school with, although he's pretty awesome too. <laughs> Moses. Charlton Heston played him in a movie called The Ten Commandments or whatever it was. Moses. Well, most of us are very familiar with the assignment that Moses has sent uh, to Pharaoh Actually, if I go back a little bit further, most of us know the story of Moses that when all of his uh, brothers, uh, I don't use the word just by blood, I mean his Hebrew brothers were being murdered in the Nile, that his life under a edict from Pharaoh, that he was preserved, he was put in a basket, and he grew up in the house of Pharaoh, and he has this moment, and it's an incredible story, that, and then he goes in the backside of the desert for 40 years, and he grows up in God, and God sends him back, and he says to Pharaoh, let my people go, um, and gives the word of the Lord to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh says, no. And then you see these series of 10 plagues. Does everyone know what I'm talking about here? If you're new to church, I'm just filling you in, it's a story, you can read about it. Well, most of us know the story of the 10 plagues, but here's what you may not know is none of the plagues were arbitrary. It's not like God woke up one day and said, oh, I know, locust. He's not arbitrary. Most of us know the story of the 10 plagues, but what you may not know is that many of the plagues are actually directed at specific Egyptian deity, gods, powers, principalities. Example, Amnura was the sun god in the Egyptian pantheon. He was also the king over all other Egyptian deities. And so what does God do? What does Yahweh do? Well, John Mark Comer says, he blots out the sun for three days, and this is Yahweh. This is God's way of saying, Amnura is not king of kings. I am. Amnura is not lord of lords. I am. But listen to me, church. Nowhere does Yahweh say that Amnura isn't a God and doesn't have power. Not capital G. God's is an Old Testament word. New Testament is power, principalities, rulers, spiritual forces of evil in high places. So nowhere does God say in this that he's just this nothingness. doesn't say that. He says, no, no, no. But he isn't Lord of Lord. He's not King of Kings. He's not all authority like I am. So once again, there's this moment where you can see if you know the story 
where the children of Israel are finally, Pharaoh lets them go. Children of Israel cross through the Red Sea on dry ground, get to the other side, and the waters begin to close on Pharaoh and his army. You see, if you grow up in countries of peace, countries that are typically peaceful countries and nations, we often view God and if God, we often ask this question in peaceful nations. If, we wrestle more with God accepting everything in our lives because if he disagrees with anything, then he's not loving. So North America struggles like, well, why, why could a loving God do X, Y, Z? How could a loving God allow ABC? So North America struggles more there. But if you grew up in Afghanistan, you ask a very different question and you can look at literature, you can study it. They would be saying this, no God, if you are not just, if you do not atone for ABC, then I don't know how you are good. So we see here in the scriptures this beautiful moment or this poetic moment, where as the waters go over Pharaoh and his army, we see a God of justice, maybe who remembers every single baby drowned in a Nile. That God is not absent or ignorant, but he is holy and just. Now fast forward to Exodus chapter 20. God gives Moses 10 commandments. And let's just look at the first two. You shall have no other gods before me. That's the first one, the first one. You shall have no other gods before me. And the next one, that's Exodus chapter 20, verse 3. Then 20 verse 4 says, You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or is in the water underneath. In other words, what are the first two commandments? Have no other gods before me. Second, have no other, make no other carved images. Now you may be going, whoo, I haven't made any carved images in my house. I don't have statues. I don't have any of those things. That doesn't necessarily mean that you don't have idols. All an idol is, is a created thing that you put as an ultimate thing. It is a something that is a created thing that you make an ultimate thing. In North America, we make power, a created thing, an ultimate thing. Money, we make the created thing, an ultimate thing. Sex is a created thing that we make an ultimate thing. And these can become idols. You can take your marriage, which is a created thing, and you can make it an ultimate thing. I can't tell you the number of times that Pastor Lori and I have been counseling together because we learned this in our own hearts and lives. I can't tell you the number of times we've been looking at a couple and they've been pouring out their heart and it's been so good. And then finally we have to take a moment and go, ooh, we got to lean into something right here. What do you have to lean into? Here's one of the problems that we are seeing in your lives. The scripture says that my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So here's the problem it has. It doesn't say that my spouse will supply all of my needs according to his, their riches and glory. What you're finding is if you ask your spouse to be God, they will always fail you. They can't be God. So what you need to do is you need to, here's the, here's the advice. You do not need to devalue one another. You need to deprioritize the relationship and put God in first position and put your marriage in second position and then watch what God will do. So whatever your spouse isn't, God can be. And you can take that pressure off of their shoulders and you can then begin to love one another. And then they say, how? And then I say, that's for professional counselors to figure out. May the Lord bless you and may he keep you. Here's the truth of it. There's 10 commandments. You don't break the remaining eight. You've got to first break the first one. I'm going to say that again. 10 commandments. You have to break the first one in order to get to the rest of them. Something else has to be a God in front of you. Something else has to become ultimate or the first two, I should say. So again, a God is an invisible but a real spiritual build, being. We don't use the word God. We use power, principality, ruler, New Testament language. Daniel chapter 10, it was the prince of the kingdom of Persia that we've covered. And again, an idol is just a created thing. We sometimes give too much power or influence in our lives. We can worship, as I've already mentioned, we can worship power. We can worship money. We can worship sex. We can worship education. We can worship marriage. We can worship singleness. We can worship any created thing can become an ultimate thing. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 20, Paul reminds us that when we worship idols, we're actually worshiping not power, money, and sex. We're worshiping the demonic dark forces behind them. 
Watch now, God commands again his covenant people to have nothing to do with both gods and idols. Why? Because conflict taking place up there somehow affects life down here. Now let's fast forward to the New Testament. An angel named Gabriel is sent to deliver a message from God. And Zechariah and Elizabeth are married, but they're not able to conceive. And for years this has been the case. And so Gabriel is an angel who stands in the presence of God. He's a messenger, and he is sent to deliver a specific message. And we see the moment in Luke chapter 1, verse 13. There are these moments where often what happens up there shows up on earth, like these angelic visitation moments. The scripture actually says that all of us have entertained angels and been unaware, that we didn't even know it, which is really weird. Some of you, I've been with people, again, who are just pray like intercessory discernment, like just that prophetic side of the ministry. And so they can be a bit peculiar, those type of people. I say that with full affection, full affection. But I've been in beautiful intercessory meetings where the person beside me begins to pray, Lord, let me see into, the, let us see into the unseen realm. Let us see into the unseen realm. And I'm sitting in that room going, Lord, don't you dare answer that prayer. Don't you dare answer that prayer. Don't you dare answer that prayer. I... I, am, I have been blessed with the spiritual gift of blissfully unaware. And I'm not looking for it to leave. I like it. Some people have a spiritual gift of discernment and they can walk down the streets and the Lord shows them things. I'm always like, Lord, thank you that you have given this gift to them. And not to me. But the angel said to him, said to Zechariah, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Why do angels say that all the time? Like a sentient being from the presence of God shows up and the first thing they say is like, hey, don't be afraid. No, I think terror is an appropriate emotion in this moment, Gabriel. <laughs> Do not be afraid, Zechariah. And here's what the scripture says, though. You, why, why don't you be afraid? Your prayer has been heard. Now, here's the thing that's incredible again. Zechariah and Elizabeth have been embarrassed their entire lives, but it's not because God didn't hear the prayer. There is something, though, in the timing of God of when it's going to be answered. There was some form of spiritual conflict that now is the appointed time for the answer to come. Your prayers have been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will call his name John. And then a man, Zachariah, here goes like, ah, I'm not sure. And, you know, all heck breaks loose, but that's a story for a different day. Again, they're praying for years for a child. While the answer took time, their prayer has been heard. Here's what's, here's what's critical. In Daniel, his prayer could be hindered, but not stopped. In Moses, Pharaoh resisted, but ultimately God prevailed. In Zechariah, similar to Daniel, his answer took time, but their prayer was heard. In church, here's what I want to say. The enemy will always, always try to rob your confidence in who God is by getting your eyes on what is or isn't happening. He wants you to define God based on the outcome, not on who God has forever said he is. Because if he can do that, he can attack truth and he can make doubt rise in your heart and life. What is one of the primary things that's being attacked in our generation? It is the word of God. Why? Because the enemy knows it has ultimate power and authority. Through human allegiance, human allegiance, either God or Satan, can gain greater power to work in our human affairs. Now, let me be crystal clear. When I say the words greater power, I don't mean increased power. That's not what I'm saying. How many know that God is all powerful? You can't subtract from it or add to it. He's all powerful. So when I say a statement like through human allegiance, either God or Satan can gain, can gain greater power, I'm not saying God can gain more power. What I'm saying, though, is when we surrender and submit to God, he doesn't gain more power, but we gain more of his power working in and through our lives. The same is also true when we submit areas of our lives to the enemy. That in those particular areas of our lives, the enemy can have legal access, not to the whole of our lives, but to the part of our lives or a part in our lives. These are called strongholds. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 to 6 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging a war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. One thing I want to highlight in this text that's often mentioned about, but I want to expose one of the schemes of the enemy so that you can see it. 
The scripture says that we're to take every thought captive. Who's heard that before? Take every thought captive. Can I see your hands, please, online? You can put a hand up in the chat. Take every thought captive. Taking every thought captive doesn't mean that you'll be free from never thinking those thoughts again. That's not what it means. If the enemy finds a place of vulnerability in your life, he's going to come at it again and again and again and again and again. And even actually, once you've been set free and remain in free, he will circle back again and again and again and again and again. If you think about a prisoner that is taken and put in captivity, it doesn't mean that the prisoner doesn't exist. It simply means that they are now in a place where they can no longer do the same level of damage and harm to your life because they are in captivity. In other words, they are under a different and a greater authority. Ah, so one of the ways in which you and I take thoughts captive. So here's, what, here's, here's why I'm saying this. There are some of you who are saying, man, I've prayed these prayers. I've done this. I've quoted God's word. And I still struggle with these thoughts. Taking every thought captive is to be able to take it and say, no, no, that is subject to who Jesus is. So in other words, I'm not going to fall into the popularity lie of our culture that says my life is defined by how many people like me. No, I'm going to take that thought captive. I'm not going to live my life into that because people can cheer me on the way up and then they can boot me on the way down pretty quick. No, no, I'm not going to buy into that. What I'm going to do is, Lord, I'm going to anchor my life in who you say I am, not who everybody else says I am. But I'm also going to be open to receive feedback from other people. I'm not going to buy into the lie that says that I am successful based upon my income and my possessions. No, I'm not going to buy the lie. I'm going to buy the truth that, God, I am who you say I am through the finished work of the cross and that I am rich in good works that you prepared in advance that I am to walk in. That it's not the accumulation of things. It is the actual generosity of things that just makes me rich in the kingdom of heaven. These are things that impact our hearts and impact our lives. The next time somebody offends you, which could have already been this morning. But the next time somebody offends you and you're tempted to speak words of slander, you take that thought captive. And you say, Father, I choose to bless them in Jesus' name. <laughs> well, I don't actually, I don't, you know, Pastor Jay, I, 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 don't ever, I, don't, I don't ever say something unless I really feel it. Why would you give your feelings that much authority and power in your life? Every feeling you have, I'm not saying it's not true. What I'm saying is every feeling you have doesn't lead you to truth. We are created body, soul, and spirit. We got all these emotions running within us. I don't know about you, but I'm going to trust Jesus and what his word says is greater than what I feel. Because I've had really good feelings that led me into really good things. And then I've had really, really feelings that I felt really strongly that actually are some of the dumbest decisions that I've ever made in my life. My feelings don't always lead me into truth, but Jesus has never failed. Are you with me? Okay, let's wrap it up. Spiritual warfare is walking according to the Spirit. It is A, how do you walk according to the Spirit? It is submitting to God's Word, taking every thought captive to obey Christ, and making your next step a surrendered step. And here's what's true. Until you submit to God's Word, until you do A, you cannot do B or C. This word, well, that's just a book. But this word, God's word, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Finished work. Now again, forever interceding because you and I are constantly tempted by powers and principalities and rulers, sometimes in us and sometimes around us. And here's the truth. Eve could not sustain, hold my calls. Eve could not sustain one temptation from the enemy. Not one. Jesus was led into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit of God. And King Jesus, he withstood 40 days and 40 nights of temptations. Jesus is our better Adam. He's our better Eve. He's our better Moses. He's our better Isaiah. He's our better David. Because everywhere that they fell, Jesus was faithful. Everything that they didn't do, Jesus accomplished fully and completely, including all authority over the works 
of darkness. Therefore, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power and it is working. When we confess sin, what are we doing? We are breaking all power, knowing and unknown that we've given to the enemy through sin. We are then bringing sin into light so that it may be healed. But the opposite is equally true, is that our unrighteousness gives the enemy legal access, not to the whole of our lives, but to a part of our lives. Confession, obedience, repentance, renouncing, forgiveness, restitution, while all that happened down here, church, when you say to someone, I forgive you, it's not just a down here thing. Something happens up here. Legal access that the enemy had to that area is now under the authority of King Jesus. And so it's no longer your power now and your willpower that the enemy has to wrestle with. He's now wrestling with the power of Christ in you, which is a higher and greater authority than you have in your own strength. The scripture says in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 13, finally, be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the, in the Lord. It's a specific thing. And in the strength of his might, not your own, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, authorities, and cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil. Where? In heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. What's the evil day? Every day. And having done all to stand firm, take up the whole armor of God. When you read through all the lists of the armor of God, you know there's a single weapon that is offensive. It's called the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. You say, why a single weapon? Man, oh man, don't need multiple weapons? No, because there is nothing more authoritative than God's word, which is why it's summarily attacked every day of our lives. Here's what is true in my heart, in my life. One time I was praying in my head, just a, just a moment with the Lord. And I was just praying. And I was just confessing things that I believed. I believe this, I believe this, everything about who God is. And I got to the point where it was, Lord, I believe that you are gracious and merciful, that you are a forgiving God. And I felt the Holy Spirit challenge my heart in this, in this. You may believe that here, but do you believe it specifically here? Of course I do, Lord. Then why are you choosing to walk in unforgiveness? My behavior did not match my beliefs. The reality is in that area, I'd given legal access for the enemy through my unforgiveness. And it required confession and repentance and asking forgiveness and bringing this under the submission of Jesus. I know lots of people who claim to believe a lot of different things, but their life sure doesn't show that they believe any of those things. When we're wounded... I believe God will justify me. Do you believe that? Then don't slander the other person. You don't need to. If you were unjustly wounded, God will deal with it. I don't believe that. I believe I must. It shows up in our behavior. I've had people talk to me, you know, till the cows come home. I believe in prayer. Do you? Out of 168 hours you were given last week, do you? I believe in the authority of God's word. Do you? And I'm not trying to sling shame. I'm just trying to be honest and get real. Why? Because this is a war that we are living in. Every single day, we are engaging these things. Give Satan nothing, and he's got nothing. Give him anything, and he'll start from that point, scheming to destroy everything God honoring in your story. Okay, let me end here. Dean Sherman said this. Satan and all his forces of darkness, which are real, do one thing with powerful precision. They do their best to persuade us from confidently believing and living in the authority God gave us through the finished work of Christ and the infilling of the Holy Spirit. So sometimes spiritual activity is within us and other times it's happening around us. The Bible, I wish I had more time here and I don't, I've already gone way over time. But the Bible, unlike dualists, me, me hold here. I'm gonna, let me put a breadcrumb here because we're going to come back here later this year. The Bible, unlike dualists, Buddhists, or Hindus, or Gnostics, describe the world in which we live in as one reality, physical and spiritual, just as we're both body and soul. Has anyone here ever had someone say this to them? I can't come to your party, but I'll be with you in spirit. 
they're just telling you they're not going to be there. That's all they're saying. <laughs> they're just really saying, I'm not, I'm not coming to your party. It doesn't mean they don't like you, just I can't make your party. They don't want to hurt you, so, but, I'll, but I'll be with you in spirit. I'd like to see you try. <laughs> Buddy, go. <laughs> For two hours, now come back to me. As foolish as, we, we know you can't do that, right? As foolish as that is. Okay, breadcrumb, open up a can of worms, and then I'm going to leave. Be careful what you do with your body. Because you can't separate your body and your spirit. As followers of Jesus, it's kind of like, well, can of worms I'm going to open and leave. For sure, I can practice everything yoga with my body, but don't worry, because my spirit's not there. I don't know how you practice Hinduism but my spirit's safe over here. I pray the whole time. Yeah, they're one thing. We as the body of Christ have an underdeveloped theology of our bodies, which is why we have no leg to stand on even in sexual conversations that we have today because we have an underdeveloped theology of what our body means because we see it as separate from my spirit's good. That's just my body. When Jesus ascended into heaven, his body went with him. We are called the body of Christ. Breadcrumbs we'll come back to you later. May God bless you and keep you. Thank <laughs> you.